let's pray. Let's just, I know we've prayed a couple times, but I just want to pray and ask for a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, to what he wants to do in this last session. I have a sense of direction and some notes here, but I really just want to follow uh, what, what God wants to do and how he wants to meet us. I believe he wants to meet us. I believe he wants to release his anointing in this place. And uh, yeah, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good. God, I thank you for the way that you've been at work even throughout this weekend, God. I thank you for the way that you've been speaking and, and touching people and setting free and breaking chains, God, and bringing deliverance, God. I thank you. That's because of your love. I thank you. It's because of the cross. It's because of what you've done, Jesus, that you, you are so faithful. And God, we honor you. We honor you. We worship you. And Holy Spirit, even as we sang earlier, we welcome you. Spirit of the living God, that you would move, that you would fall upon us in this place. God, that you would anoint us, Lord. I thank you that you are raising up an army, God, to set captives free. And I pray, Lord, even among this room, God, that you would be anointing your people, God, raising an army to set captives free, Father, in the name of Jesus. And so we give you this time, we give you this evening, and we thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to talk for a little while tonight about uh, multiplying the ministry of deliverance and uh, some of the keys for that. And specifically, we're going to go eventually into um, a time of just teaching on the, the significance of the, the power of the Holy Spirit and, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we need in order to set captives free. Um, how many know that Jesus, even though he is unique as the Son of God, as God himself in the flesh, when he ministered on earth, he, he didn't keep that ministry to himself, right? He actually multiplied his ministry even before he ascended to heaven. And that's um, specifically true as we're talking about this area of deliverance. When we started on Friday night, we were in Mark chapter 1. We talked about how when Jesus started his ministry, he was in the synagogue and there was a demonic manifestation. Jesus cast out the demon. And then uh, Mark 1.39, it says he was preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. It gave kind of that summary. But you look at uh, then Mark chapter 3. I'm just going to mention a couple of scriptures quickly. We're, we're eventually going to be, by the way, in Luke chapter 11. But uh, I'm just going to kind of touch on some things real quick. But um, in Mark chapter 3, 14 and 15, it says that he called 12 to himself. He, he appointed the 12 that were going to be his closer disciples. And he appointed them that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority over unclean spirits. So he's calling these other disciples now, and he's bringing them to, to learn from him, to be with him, to hear his teaching, to, to get to know him in a closer way, and that he, would, he was going to send them out to also do the same ministry that he was doing. Right? And then in, in Mark chapter 6, we see the fulfillment of that. In Mark 6, 7, it said he, he called the 12, and he sent them out two by two, and gave them authority over unclean spirits. And it says later in verse 12 and 13, it says that they went out and they preached that people should repent. And it says they cast out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Right? So think about that. That's multiplication. Right? Mark chapter 1, it says that Jesus was going about he, um, casting out preaching and casting out demons. Mark chapter 6, there's now 12 others. Went from 1 to 12. Right? From 1 to 12. Then we see in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, that he called 70 others also, it says, and he sent them out two by two to preach, to heal, to cast out demons. They came back saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So now it's expanded further. Went from 1 to 12, add 70 to that. So it's growing, it's expanding, it's increasing. And then... In Mark 16, 17, it says, These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. So it started with Jesus, went to the 12 apostles, expanded further to a group of 70 other, other uh, followers of Jesus, then it expanded to the whole church. Do you see this expansion? Jesus never intended to be the exclusive exorcist. Do you know that? Do you know that deliverance is not meant for a small select few? 
Do you know that deliverance is not just meant for somebody who is a pastor or who preaches or who writes books or who travels as an evangelist or a minute, right? Deliverance, it says, these signs follow those who believe. Every single believer has the authority to cast out demons. I want to tell you something. If I can do this, you can do this. I had no background in it. I told my story on Friday, so if you missed that, you'll have to watch the recording. I think they're going to put it on YouTube eventually, and you can watch that recording. I told my story. I had no background in this. I had no training in this. And I do believe that God will call specific people maybe to have more of an emphasis on this ministry, just like other ministries, right? Just like every believer can lay hands on the sick to pray for healing. But then some might be gifted or more anointed in the area of healing. Every believer can share their faith. Every believer should, you know, can share the gospel. But then some, are, might be, some might be called to an evangelist, to be like a more full-time focus on an evangelism, right? It's the same thing with deliverance. Every believer has the authority to cast out demons. Simply because you are in Christ and Christ is in you and it's in his name. Right? So Jesus was multiplying. I want to I say this. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now that's true in general, but we're talking for deliverance. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We've seen this, we've, we've, we've seen this now because in Lancaster, <laughs> in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, <laughs> uh, Lancaster. Um, it sounds funny for me to say that now. I'm used to saying it the, the, the right way now. So, uh, in Lancaster, we, 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 the, the, at the church I pastor called Threshold Church, we, we teach on deliverance. We have a monthly deliverance service where people come. And so it kind of starts, you know, becomes known in that area and people reach out. And, and so we have people reaching out to us literally from all over the world. That's not an exaggeration. Literally. We had one lady from a neighboring county who had requested through our website to receive prayer for deliverance. And we had reached back out to her and uh, scheduled an appointment and prayed for her and saw her set free from some areas. But she told us that she had actually reached out to 50 different churches, 5-0, 50 different churches in the area. And our church was the only one who actually even responded to her <laughs> request. Right? That tells me something's missing. That tells me something's missing. Last week, on Wednesday night, we had our deliverance service. We had people from New York, from New Jersey, from Maryland, from Virginia, from Myrtle Beach. Five different you know, states outside of Pennsylvania. And that's like, that's so exciting. That's, oh, that's amazing. I'm like, but why? Why, do, why should people have to travel to a different state to receive deliverance? Why should people have to go across the country, right, to find, to find this? So God is in the process of restoring the ministry of deliverance. I believe in many ways the church of right now, this hour, finds itself in a very similar situation that the disciples did in Mark chapter 9. Sorry, I'm not at Luke 11 yet. I'm just going to kind of preach for a little while. Just go. In Mark chapter 9, I'm just going to paraphrase this, but in Mark chapter 9, this is this time where Jesus went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. If you know that story, he took Peter, James, John, three of his closest disciples. He went up on this mountain. He was praying. He was transfigured. It means he was like transformed, changed before them. He became bright like, like lightning. His face was shining. There's this incredible encounter with God the Father. This cloud comes and the, the Father speaks and this incredible, incredible encounter. And they're up on this mountain. But then, then when they go down the valley, then when they go down the mountain into the valley, they, they get to this scene where there's an argument happening between some of the scribes and, and the other nine disciples. And Jesus says, what, what's going on here? What's, what are you arguing about? And this father, this desperate father, comes to Jesus and says, Lord, have mercy on me. Help my son. He's severely oppressed by a demon. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cast it out. And what's interesting about that is that this is after Jesus had already given them authority. Because Mark 3, he gave them authority. Mark 3, sorry, 6, he sent them out with authority, and they were already doing this. 
So like something happened between Mark 6 and Mark 9. We don't, I don't know what was going on. Jesus said there was unbelief there and there was a need for you know, prayer and fasting and that whole thing. But, but something happened where they had been sent out, they had been casting out, but they lost it. They lost something. And I believe that's where many in the Western church, we, that, that's where we find ourselves. Not able to meet the needs of the generation. Not able to meet the needs of the people in need. And here's the thing. Jesus and the disciples, they ascended the hill. They ascended the mountain, but they didn't stay on the mountain. See, we have to ascend the mountain so that we can meet the needs in the valley. The church that will not ascend the mountain to encounter God will not be able to meet the needs in the valley. And here's what happens. See, they were arguing. They were, they were debating. When we lose the power of God, we can only resort to arguing. We can only resort to debating. We can only resort to word battles. When we lose the power of God, when the power goes out, we, we resort to just this method or that method or this information or all, all, these, tri- all these things. And I don't, I don't mean to say this as like a, a critical statement, just more as an analysis. By and large, in, in, in the Western church, we're missing the power of God. We're, we're missing that. And so we, we've tried to figure out all kind of ways to, to reach people, but we're missing the power of God. We found all, we, we've tried to find all kind of ways to be relevant. And I think sometimes we've tried so hard to be relevant that we become powerless. And here's the reality. A powerless church will never be relevant. I want to be relevant to that demonized boy. That's who I want. I want to be relevant to the one that's in need of salvation. I want to be relevant to that one that's in need of healing. I want to be relevant to that one that's in need of deliverance because I want to be able to have that, the anointing of God's spirit to minister to them, to meet their need. And as the church, if we will ascend the mountain of God through prayer, through seeking, through worship, through encounter with him, we'll have what we need then to when we encounter those situations. So there's a need to recover this ministry in our hour, which is why I'm so excited about churches like this that are willing to go there, that are willing to say, hey, we're going to talk about this subject. Hey, we're, gonna, we're not going to be afraid to talk about this. We're not going to be afraid because this is real. This is biblical. This is the gospel. This is part of what Jesus calls us to do. It's not the whole of everything, but it's a critical part that needs to be in the right place. And so I believe God wants to multiply the ministry of deliverance. My, my goal is not to be known as the deliverance guy. I'm actually a Jesus guy. <laughs> That's who I, I'm a Jesus guy. Jesus happens to be a deliverer. Okay? But when I minister and when I equip, I'm, I want to equip other people. I want to train other people. My goal, you know, as I'm training people, is when they encounter somebody that needs deliverance, that their first response is not, oh, I better call Jake. Right? My goal is that they've been equipped and trained and they can step in and they can do it. Now, I'm, the, I'm willing to help. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll help. I'll mentor. I'll coach. I'll, if you need to call, great. I'm available. But my goal is not that you, the first thing you think is, oh, demon, I better call Jake. No. This is not Ghostbusters. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> uh. I've never said that before. <laughs> just kind of the unction, the unction. You know, it was just, it was just it's the West Coast. It's just, it's just drawing it out of me. You know, it's just, it's just. Uh, here we go. Woo! I better, I better get in here. We, we went to Ghostbusters now. Come on, let's go. Whew. So just, just like Jesus in that time was working to multiply, to spread. I believe he's doing the same thing today. He's raising up people. He's raising up churches. And I believe this is a church that God wants to use in this area of deliverance for this region. How many people know Seattle needs deliverance? 
How many people know the state of Washington can use a little deliverance here? Come on now. Come on now. And I believe God wants to deposit something in this church family to release an impartation of anointing, of grace, to see many people delivered and set free. I believe there's a key in Luke chapter 11 that we're going to go over here. So now we're there. Luke 11. There's a key in this story, starting in verse 5. We're going to read, in, uh, starting in verse 5. You know, so when, when it comes to stepping out and ministering deliverance, I, I always say there's no formula. You know, I teach basic uh, models, equipping people with different keys and foundational principles, absolutely, to help people, you know, get started. But, but there's no formula, there's no exact formula for deliverance. But, but there's certain things that we can grow in. And it, first of all, it all starts out of intimacy with God. It all starts out of relationship with Him because all true ministry comes from our relationship with God. So it starts in that place of intimacy with Him, relationship with Him. That's ascending that mountain. That's knowing Him for who He is. It, it, it starts in that place. We, we grow in that place. We grow in compassion for people as, we're, as we get to know His heart, as we get to experience His presence and His love. But then Jesus also, he gave his disciples authority, and he gave them power. He gave them power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's a key here in Luke 11 that I believe is going to help us receive a fresh anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, verse 5. Now, he's telling a parable that's related to prayer. Because if you go back to verse 1, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And so he goes through this prayer we know is the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. He kind of walks him through that. And then in verse 5, he tells this parable. He says, he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. I have nothing to set before him. He will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Then he continues the teaching here. He says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? It's interesting. The very next statement is he was casting out a demon and it was mute. It goes right into a deliverance there. But this whole teaching, it starts with... It starts with the disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray. It's about prayer. It's about prayer. And he talks about you know, praying through like the Lord's Prayer, different, different aspects of prayer, honoring God and confession of sin and asking for our needs to be met and praying for deliverance from the evil one, right, from temptation. But, but, he, but he tells this parable and, the, and, and, and then this teaching about asking, seeking, knocking. But the whole thing culminates with that one statement. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? To those who ask Him. In other words, the whole focus of the prayer is receiving the Holy Spirit. The whole focus of the asking, the seeking, the knocking, everything culminates and leads to that one statement. The whole focus, the whole target of the prayer in this context is to receive the Holy Spirit. And I believe that as Christians, sometimes we make the mistake that we stop asking for the Holy Spirit. We stop asking for the Holy Spirit 
Because he already lives inside of us, so we think, well, I already have the Holy Spirit, or I've already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, 10 years ago, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, or, you know, 20 years ago, or five years ago, you know, I, I received the Holy Spirit, I spoke in tongues, or I saw the gifts of the Spirit operating, right? And that all, that's all true. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, the moment a person that turns their life to Christ, repents of their sin, they put their faith in the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. At that moment, that, that is true. But when you look at the pattern of the New Testament, and you look at the pattern of the early church, you'll see that they were filled with the Holy Spirit multiple times. You know, Jesus in John 21, I think, at the end of the Gospel of John, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's, I believe, when they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Right? But then he told them, wait for the promise of the Father. He told them, wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So they were waiting in the upper room. They were praying. They were seeking. They were asking. They were waiting on the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit's poured out on the day of Pentecost. They're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then within the next couple chapters, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit two more times. In Acts chapter 4, he was filled with the Holy Spirit when they were starting to persecute him because he healed somebody, raised him up, the, the cripple. It said, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said. And then they cried out to God and it said the whole place was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. What does that tell me? We need multiple encounters with the Holy Spirit. There is more. There's more for us to receive. So we have to live in this tension, this divine tension of stewarding what God's already given us while being hungry for more. Stewarding well what God's already put in us, deposited in us. Not negating the fact that he's already given us his spirit inside us, but also realizing there has to be more. You know, it's healthy to live in a place like that where you say, God, there has to be more. There has to be more. We need more, God, of your presence. We need, God, your spirit to pour out. We need, Father, to see your Holy Spirit move in a fresh way. We sang, God, send revival. God, move by your spirit. To live in that place of spiritual hunger. And that's the target of the prayer. It's the target of the asking, the seeking, the knocking. But I want you to see the motive behind it. This is so critical. And when you go back into the parable, it shows us this motive. When you look at verse 6, you know, he goes to him at midnight. Now that is late, midnight, especially in their time frame, right? They don't have electricity. I'm not sure when their normal bedtime was, but I think midnight to them might be like 2 or 3 in the morning to us. That's late, Right? But notice in verse 6, why he asked for the bread. He says, a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. I have nothing to set before him. Why was he asking for bread? He was not asking for bread to feed himself. He was asking for bread to feed the person in need. That tells me that's the motive of asking for the Holy Spirit's power. That's the motive for asking for the Holy Spirit's power. That's why we need a greater measure of his anointing upon our lives. Not so that we can feed ourselves, but so that we can feed the ones in need, the people around us who are in need of salvation, who are in need of deliverance from addiction, who are in need of salvation, who are in need of healing. That's why we ask. That's why we seek. That's why we knock. It gives us the right heart posture, the right motive. Because we will be tempted to use the anointing for the wrong reason. See, Jesus had to pass this test. Jesus had to pass this test. It was the first test when he was in the wilderness. Right after he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, I read from Isaiah 61 this morning in the service. I talked about that verse, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? Right after Jesus received that anointing, when he was baptized in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit came upon him. The very next thing that happened is he was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. It says he was hungry. Obviously, he was hungry. He had been fasting for 40 days. 
And they said that the tempter came to him, the devil came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. What was, what was the devil after? What was, he, what was he going for? He wasn't just trying to get him to break his fast. It was so much deeper than that. First of all, he questioned the very thing that God the Father had just spoken. The last word that the Father had spoken at his baptism was, This is my Son, whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. Understand this, that when God speaks to you, the, 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 the devil will go after that very thing that God has just spoken. To plant seeds of doubt. The first words out of the devil's mouth in Scripture, Did God really say? In the Garden of Eden, did God really say? Did he really say? Did he... If you, if you are the Son of God. But what was he tempting Jesus to do? He was tempting Jesus to take the anointing and the authority that he had received and to use it to feed himself instead of to feed others. Jesus knew what the anointing was for. And it was not for his own glory or his own benefit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to declare deliverance to captives, right? Think about, it was all focused on other people. It was all focused on bringing help to people in need. And so what did, what did Jesus, how did Jesus respond when the devil tempted him? He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He said, I'm feeding on what the Father has already spoken over me. I'm living on that bread. I'm living on what God says about me. I don't need to prove I'm a son. I am a son. And if we are not secure in that place as a son or a daughter, we will take the anointing and the authority that God has given us for the purpose of benefiting others and we'll take it for our own sake instead. This is so critical. It's so critical. See, the, the, the man came to the house. He came to knock on that door and he was not doing it for his own benefit. He was risking maybe who knows what, making his friend mad, making his friend upset, going at midnight. It's Pretty audacious thing to do. So God wants us to have that heart motivation. God doesn't give us the anointing to make us famous. That's not why he gives us the anointing. He doesn't give us the anointing so we can feel special. So we have to, when our heart is being fed by, by, by God and what he says about us, we can have that security as sons and daughters, so that when God anoints us, we can use it for the right purpose. We can use it for the right reason. But notice, he said, I have nothing to set before him. That means that without the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't have what people need. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't give to that demonized boy that the disciples, they couldn't cast the demon out. They, they, they didn't have what they needed to give him. Because the reality is you can't give what you don't have. I mean, Stephen, I'd love to give you a $100 bill. I don't have one in my pocket. I, if I, no, nowhere on me, I don't have, a, I have a piece of gum. I could give you a piece of gum because that's what I have in my pocket. You can't, have, you can't give what you don't have. Peter said to the man that was crippled, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. What I have I give to you. And this is what drives us to the place of prayer. When we recognize, God, I have nothing to give. God, I, apart from you, I can do nothing. So many times I've felt like that, like that situation. 
Like, God, like, where nothing happened. You know, I prayed that prayer. I, you know, yeah, we, we have all these great stories. It's awesome. And I, I love sharing the testimonies of deliverance and healing and breakthrough. It's incredible, right? It builds faith. And, but, but the fact is, there's also so many times where I, where I pray and I'm like, God, what? I have nothing to give that person. I didn't have what I needed in that situation. There was no tangible result or, or fruit from that. And what that does is, see, when we experience lack, it should drive us to the place of prayer. It should drive us to the place of the one who has no lack, to receive more from him. We pray, God, give me that bread. Give me that bread from heaven so I could feed the ones in need. Give me that bread from heaven so I could have something to share, to feed, to nourish, to heal, to save, to deliver. Now I want you to notice one more key here. And that's in verse 8. It says, Though he will not rise to him and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence. He will rise and give him as many as he needs because of his persistence. And when he goes on to that next section, ask and you'll receive. Each of those words, ask, seek, and knock, in the original Greek language is written in a tense called the present continuous tense. All that means is it's essentially saying continue, ask and keep on asking. That's a more literal translation of what is being said. Ask and keep on asking and you will receive. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be opened. He's talking about a persistence. That word where it says persistent, because of his persistence, it means a shameless insistence and persistence. It's bold. It's tenacious. It's faith-filled. It's a persistence that won't take no for an answer. Friendship got him to the door. Persistence got the door open. Friendship gave him the confidence to go and knock on that door. Because he wouldn't go to a stranger's house. He wouldn't go to a random person he didn't know. That would, that would be too far. That would be, that'd be, that'd be taking it too far. That, who knows what could happen then. He can get clobbered. He can get attacked. <laughs> but he's, okay, this is my friend. At least I have, a re- I have a relationship with him. I know him. He knows me. That gave him the boldness, the confidence to get in front of that door and at midnight start to knock on that door. Right? But persistence is what got the answer. And it's the same with our relationship with God. Our, our friendship with God, our relationship with God gives us the boldness to go before the throne of grace. Gives us the confidence that we can come to him. But there's a persistence in a seeking and an asking and a knocking. I love, I love reading the stories of some of the great past you know, leaders in the church, revivalists, evangelists, missionaries. Anybody like reading biographies and just stories of just kind of heroes of the faith? Mm-hmm. I've noticed a pattern with some, some of them that they, they've, they've gone through seasons of desperate seeking for a greater anointing of the Holy Spirit. Some of the greatest evangelists and revivalists, I think of like D.L. Moody in the, I think, 1800s, maybe into the 1900s. He went through a time. He was, was by by the standards of the time, he was a successful evangelist. And he was preaching and he was seeing God bring salvation to people. and, And then one day after a church service, two old ladies in the church came up to him and said, you need the Holy Spirit. His first response was he was offended. And then his second response was he was convicted. And it's true, it caused this hunger in him, this hunger, this desperation in him that he needed to see the power of the Holy Spirit at work in his life, at work in his ministry. And he began this season of seeking, of crying out to God, of persisting, of praying, of desperation, of tears, of longing, of, of just insisting for months and months and months of fasting and prayer. And he said one day he was walking down the streets of New York City and the power of the Holy Spirit just came upon him. 
out of nowhere for, to the point where he thought he was going to die. He had to find a friend's house to go get alone with God. And the Holy Spirit was going through him and through him and through him to the point he thought if God didn't stay his hand, he was going to die in that much presence of God. And he said from that point on, everything changed. He spoke the same messages, but now all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit moved in such power, and there was such conviction of sin. There was such turning over of people to the Lord. That's the power of a, an encounter with God. You read the stories of some of the early Pentecostal pioneers. Of John G. Lake is one of my favorites. Hey, he was in Washington. He was in Spokane. Did I say it right? Spokane, Washington. Come on now. I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> that was one of the areas that he lived in for a while. There was other places. He went to Africa for a while. He had a season of longing, of hungering, of seeking, of knocking, of fasting, of praying. And people thought he was crazy. Like, what are you talking about? You have the Holy Spirit. And, you know, don't let anybody quench your hunger. Don't let anybody talk you out of your hunger. They tried to talk him out of his hunger, and he just would set aside the time to pray and to seek and to long and to fast and to ask for the Holy Spirit's power, to ask for that anointing. And one day he went to go pray for somebody who was sick. I believe the person, I think, was in a wheelchair or bedridden. Him and another minister friend, they went to the house. And he was kind of sitting off to the side, and his friend was talking to the, to the guy. and um, or I, can't, I can't remember if it was a guy or a lady, but he was off to the side. And all of a sudden, as he's sitting there, he begins to feel this mist, this presence of the Holy Spirit just begin to fall like rain, just coming through him. And he's like, he just kind of like waits, and, and he hears the Holy Spirit say, I've heard your prayers. I've seen your tears. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he felt the power of God begin to go through his body like electricity, just flowing through him. And he was just lost in this encounter, began to speak in tongues and had this power of God just flowing through him, coursing through his body. And his friend called him over to help then pray. He could barely walk. He was shaking under the power of God moving. And he barely went to touch the person and like a bolt of lightning just like shot through him and landed in this person and the, the, his minister friend got knocked to the ground and the person they were praying for got instantly healed and it completely revolutionized his ministry god sent him to south africa planted hundreds hundreds of churches i believe saw thousands and thousands of salvations people come to christ thousands of miracles one of the cities he was in i can't remember if it was spokane or one of the other ones was declared at one point the healthiest city in the United States. They had over 400,000 documented healings. They opened up healing rooms where people could come and receive prayer for healing from all over the place. But it all stemmed from this encounter that he had with the Holy Spirit after persistency and seeking and knocking. Persistence is a key to receiving, not because God's reluctant to give. I just, I think there's something that happens inside of us in the process of the persistence that refines us, that strengthens us, that purifies our motives, that prepares us to receive so that we can steward what we receive. I want us to stand to our feet. I want us to stand to our feet. We're going to, in just a minute or two, we're going to begin to go into a time of just prayer and asking for the Holy Spirit's power in a fresh way. I tell you, I'm preaching to myself tonight. I need this. I need this. I need, I need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I need a fresh filling and anointing so I have something to give to the ones in need. I have something to give to the one that's desperate, to the one that's broken, to the one that's lost, to the one that's bound. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask. It says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so we're going to ask. We're going to... We're going to have a time of prayer where we are going to ask 
for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon our lives. And I'm going to specifically pray over this congregation, over this group here, over the leadership here, over the team here, for the power of the Holy Spirit, for the anointing, for deliverance, to rest upon this place, upon this people, and that God's going to commission you to carry this ministry, to carry this anointing, to see captives set free. It says in Acts 10.38 that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power to go about doing good and healing those oppressed by the devil. So that's what we're praying for. That's the anointing we're praying for. Would you just lift up your hands to the Lord? We're just going to pray a really simple prayer of asking for the Holy Spirit. And we're going to do it just even for, for a little while, just without any music. Because I just want it to be real and just raw and just God's presence. I love music. It doesn't make it not real. Um, but I just want it to be so just his spirit. Pray this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that washes me. It makes me a temple for the Holy Spirit. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit lives inside of me. And I ask for your Spirit to come upon me in a new way. I ask for your anointing, for the power of your Spirit to empower me, to set captives free, anoint me to heal the brokenhearted, to cast out spirits, to bring salvation to the lost, to bring healing to the sick, for your glory. I ask for your compassion to fill my heart. Give me your love for the ones in need and give me your power to set captives free. I want you just to wait on the Lord as I'm going to begin to pray over you. I'm just going to ask for that Holy Spirit's power, Holy Spirit power to fall in this place. Father, in the name of Jesus, let the heavens be opened right now. Let the power of the Holy Spirit, God, begin to fall in this room upon every person under the sound of my voice. God, those that will watch this video, let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon them to release your anointing, God. We ask for bread from heaven, God, to give to the ones in need. God, not just to have a fun experience, Lord, not just to have thrills and chills, God, but that we could actually have the anointing to set captives free. God, I ask for bread from heaven, Lord. God, let the power of the Holy Spirit fall in this place, God. Let a baptism of the Holy Spirit come upon, Lord, each person in this room. I pray a release, God, the anointing for deliverance, God, upon this church body, upon the people in this room. Let the anointing for deliverance, God, rest upon this place, upon this people. God, I pray for an impartation of the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray for an impartation, Lord, of the anointing for deliverance right now to come upon you, to come upon you, to come upon you, to come upon every person in this room. God, let the wind of your spirit blow through this place. God, let the fire of the Holy Spirit fall in this place. God, let the anointing of your spirit fall in this place, be released in this place, God. Lord, I pray that let gifts of the Holy Spirit right now be released into your people in this room, God. Lord, I pray right now, let the gift of discerning of spirits, God, from your spirit be released in this place, God. God, let the gift of words of knowledge, Lord, be released, God, to the people in this room. Let the gift of miracles, the gift of faith, Lord, the gift of healings be released, God, to the people in this room. I say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, we wait upon you, God. Just, we're just going to continue to wait upon the Lord. He's falling in this place. He's moving in this place. Some of you are experiencing a tangible presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon you right now. Some of you are, might feel like heat coming upon you. You might feel like fire or a tangible power of God moving through your body. Just focus on Jesus. Focus on him. He's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, would you walk through this room as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit and fire? Thank you, God. Come, Holy Spirit.
more, God, of you, your glory, your presence, Lord, your anointing. Just wait upon you, God. We wait upon you. As we wait upon him, I believe he's just going to continue to come and continue to touch people, continue to fill people. Thank you, God. We wait upon you. Lord, release wave after wave, God, of your glory. Wave after wave, God, of your presence, of your love, the power of your spirit. Thank you, God. Spirit, release your anointing, release your anointing. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We're going to have a time of just laying on of hands for a little bit, just prayer of laying on of hands. And it's one of the ways that we see in the scriptures where the Holy Spirit would come upon people through the laying on of hands. Um, I want to just ask a, a couple groups of people. Um, just begin to come to the front. If that's okay to have people coming to the front. Okay. Um, one is, if you are in this time of waiting and just receiving, experiencing a, some sort of a tangible sensation of the presence of God or the Holy Spirit coming upon you, um, would you just begin to come to the front? If you're, if you're sensing God's Spirit moving upon you in some way, if you're experiencing some sort of a tangible presence of God, if you can just begin to come to the front. And by the way, if you're not feeling anything, that's perfectly okay. I've had many services where I was, people were feeling stuff and all this stuff happening. And I'm like, mm, I'm not feeling anything right now, but that's okay. Um, but sometimes when people are feeling like a tangible presence of God, it's like just a, a indication of people he wants to move on and, and um, minister to or, or touch. Second group of people I want to ask to come is if you have sensed a specific calling to the area of deliverance, like you feel a real sense of calling from the Lord, maybe even some of you have had dreams. I, I shared how God called me in a dream, or maybe you had prophetic words or just a desire, a passion. You sense a specific calling, a drawing to the area of, of deliverance. So if that's you and you, um, if you begin to make your way up here as well, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Now, what I want to do is um, I'm just going to begin to go around and just begin to lay hands upon people. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible to have a little bit of ba light background music. I'm going to pray for you because you're sensing God's presence. I don't know if there's a way to have just a light worship music or a pad or something. Just prayer gathering, prayer gathering prayers would be awesome. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just going to go around and just, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on each person. It just might be a couple seconds, might be 30 seconds, unless God zones in on something. And just going to begin to lay hands. And I believe in the power of the laying on of hands. It's a biblical principle. It's one of the foundational teachings in the book of Hebrews, the laying on of hands. I think it's in Acts 19. It says, when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And I believe when I lay hands upon you, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. Whether you feel anything or not, I believe when I lay hands upon you, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and release an anointing upon you to increase that grace to set captives free. Amen? So I'm just going to begin to do that. I'm going to lay hands. Um, we'll do this for a little while, and then maybe we'll have a dismissal in about 10 minutes or something like that. That's all right. And then we'll, we'll offer some more prayer as well for people that want to receive individual prayer. But 
Amen? On the front, I would just encourage you to engage just by praying, maybe interceding, and just, uh, just or engaging on, with the Lord or waiting on Him.